Hello everyone. We are about to start. Let's wait for an extra minute because I see that many, many folks are joining us live today. I don't want them to skip the beginning. That's why one extra minute and we will be good to go. And also quick uh, housekeeping matter. Today, I'm going just to do a deep dive. I'm going to be hands-on showing you how to build those multi-region applications. And possibly I will not have enough time to answer all of the questions. But luckily, a few of my brilliant colleagues also joined this session today, and which means that keep sending you questions. And I think that those questions will be answered as you go. So that's don't wait for me to answer the questions. Don't rely on me, but keep in mind that my colleagues will be waiting for the questions to come for you. So whether you're watching on LinkedIn or whether you are watching on Zoom or other place, keep sending your questions. Okay, it's uh, one uh, hour, two minutes in, uh, in the East Coast of the United States and we are good to go. Uh, welcome, 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 my friends, and I'm glad to see so many of you joining us live today. I like to see the number of attendees, and you know what? It tells me that many of us are truly interested in how to build and design multi-region applications that scale and never fail. Why did we decide to arrange this event today and not earlier or later? Frankly speaking, we waited for the Super Bowl. We wanted this big game to demonstrate that multi-region applications make total sense. And speaking about the Super Bowl, most of us watched Super Bowl live. Many of us watched this game on Paramount+. Plus. Paramount+, Plus is a fast-growing streaming platform where we can watch our favorite movies, series, and live events, including the Super Bowl. And today, I want you to leave this session with two things in mind. First, I want you to listen to the story of the Paramount Plus. We just want to reflect on it because we want to see the story, the changes that brought them to the success of the latest Super Bowl event. And also, most importantly, I want you to take advantage of various design patterns that you can use for your multi-region applications. Because most of you, probably most of you, don't need to run at the Super Bowl scale. But nevertheless, most of you still want to take advantage of multi-region architectures for scalability, high availability, performance, or data regulatory requirements. So that's why let's start with a story. And those of you who know me, as long as I'm watch, as well, as long as I'm wearing this headset today and not talking to this mic, it's going to be a deep dive session. We are going to run demos, real application in the real multi-region cloud environment. Because my purpose is just to show you how these things work in practice and how you can optimize your application. And then, if you find this useful then you can go and Google and find some interesting resources so that you can implement your multi-region uh, solution. However, in the beginning, still I have a few slides because as I said, the first goal of the session is just quickly introduce you to the story of Paramount Plus. So in 2023, Paramount Plus successfully migrated to a new multi-region architecture. Historically, they used Google Cloud Platform. The platform the streaming platform was running in that cloud environment. And then if you check the blog post, and this is the screenshot from the blog post, you will find several reasons that uh, required this migration. So one of the reasons was high availability. Uh, the Paramount engineering team wanted to make sure that they can tolerate even zone and region level outages. And another reason is, even if they go across multiple regions, they wanted to make sure that the latency and the user experience will not be impacted. So a few reasons. Eventually, what they did, they remained, they continued using Google Cloud, and they transitioned to that multi-region architecture in GCP. According to their summary, the migration of the application layer 
was quite straightforward. They just basically went ahead and deployed their application instances across multiple regions. Also, in the same article, they highlighted that there is one, there was one tricky component of their platform that required, you know, some extra efforts. And that component was the database. So this is the quote from the Paramount Plus article. Historically, the previous version of the Paramount Plus was hosted on a single master database. And uh, they certainly used replica nodes, but there was one primary database instance that was keeping the primary copy of the data and that was processing reads and write requests. They had already had experience with sharding. They wanted this database to be scalable. They wanted this database to be resilient. And they had experience with sharding and they knew that that would be a laborious process to run sharded database instance across multiple regions. And eventually they started checking the database market and they selected several candidates and they settled down with Yuga by DB. Yuga by DB is a distributed database uh, that is built on PostgreSQL. And then eventually, according to the title, they migrated to multiple regions in GCP. They successfully migrated their application tier and also they switched to a new multi-region database deployment. And looks like, my friends, that new architecture was paying off really well. Why? On January 23rd, the Paramount published a press update. They said that NFL on CBS scored the most watched NFL divisional playoff game ever with more than 50 million viewers. And Paramount Plus streaming platform recorded its most streamed live event. You know what happened a week later? We had another major game. So a week later, on January 30th, uh, they delivered the most watched AFC championship game. Okay, And this time, 55 million viewers watched the game live. And the Paramount Plus streaming platform beats its own record once again, recording another most, most streamed live event ever. And now we are coming to the Super Bowl. And this Super Bowl was the most watched telecast in history, according to Paramount Plus. And just think about this. More than 123 million people watched Super Bowl Live. And this is actually the justification that that migration to a multi-region architecture was the right choice. And now let's try to think. Is there any secret sauce? Definitely, I would say that Paramount Plus engineering team did an exceptional and great job by making this happen. There is certainly some secret sauce in their own implementation. However, when it comes to multi-region deployments, the secret sauce is well known. You as an engineer, architect, or technical decision maker, you already know that when you are, there are various design patterns, there are various best practices for streaming application or for Kubernetes deployments. You also have best practices for microservices deployments or for API gateways. And certainly we have design patterns for multi-region global applications. And today what's gonna to happen next, I want you to learn and to see in action several design patterns for multi-region applications that will help you to build apps that can scale across regions or other distant locations, that can tolerate various outages, and that can execute a user request with low latency, regardless of the user location. Before we go to the demo, because we are done with the slides primarily, I want you to read this disclaimer. So the following slides and hands-on demo are unrelated to the Paramount Plus architecture. I'm going to use a sample application to demonstrate several design patterns for multi-region applications. We, the Yuga by DB team, cannot comment on whether Paramount Plus uses or does not use the discussed patterns. We have some contractual obligations, so you should understand that. Now, let's talk about my application. And as I said in the beginning, because some of you joined this stream later, if you have any questions coming, please send them in Zoom, in LinkedIn, depending when you're watching us on, and my colleagues will be will do their best to answer them live. So my sample application, I'm going to show you a movie recommendation service. That movie recommendation service will take our questions in plain English, and then will provide us with various movies to watch. 
And this is, will be one of the standard generative AI application. This is a Java application that uses Spring Boot, Spring AI, and the database is Postgres. We're using PG Vector for the similarity search over our movies catalog. We are not going to go into the details because I understand that not, not all of you use Java, but nevertheless, I just need to start this application. So the application has the backend, and let's do this uh, my, my one Spring Boot run. I'm starting the backend, and the backend will connect to my locally running Postgres instance. Sounds good. So this is my Postgres database. It's up and running. And now the backend is up. Let's start the front end. Good. Ready to go. That's the address. Where is my browser? It's here. Signing in. Okay, so that's the interface. It's quite simple, but it, it's minimalistic. This is what I, I need. Now, let's see how the application works. Let's say that I am in a mood to watch some movie about a space adventure. And I can ask this prompt. A space adventure with unexpected ending. I'm sending this question and I'm getting this result back. Okay, and you can use various parameters. For instance, you can say that you are interested in the movies with the rank seven or above, and you want to watch only the movies from the science fiction category. None. So this is the list. Also, how about this prompt? A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. I guess that many of you have already recognized uh, the sentence, that's the beginning of Star Wars. And my application recognized this and it provided me with various recommendations. Also, what we are going to use next, this application uh, implements the APIs. It's like how this front end interacts with the back end of the application. It sends those typical HTTP requests. And I can just go to my terminal window. I was checking it. And I can send this API request to my locally running backend. I'm saying I want to search for the movies. That's the API endpoint. And this is the last prompt that I typed in the user interface. Also, I can define several other parameters, such as the rank. The rank needs to be of seven or above. And lastly, that's my API key. Yes, I, at least I took care of the security a little bit. I am using uh, Spring security here. Okay, I'm sending this request and then I'm getting back the same response. It's a JSON format. So this is how this application looks like. Now, if to show you the database, the database right now, I selected Postgres as a database. This is my default database. That's my database of choice. This is when I start. And this is the table. I have this movies table. I, uh, I have those embeddings that were generated for this application. And I am using uh, the PG Vector extension, for instance, uh, to show you how it works. Let me at least uh, go and create and request the extensions list. So this is the extension enables the similarity search. This extension makes this application look smart. Now, let's talk about multi-region. I created this movie recommendation service. And now I want to launch it. I want this service to be used by the customers in the United States. And I want this service to be highly available. And I want this service to be scalable and performant, which means that I want to deploy it across multiple regions. I want, it to, I want all of the users to have the same latency, low latency, the same experience. And I want this service to withstand various outages. Now let's talk about multi-region uh, deployments. The question is, how do we move forward with multi-region deployments? Because we as developers, we know how to build applications that function in a single region or in a single data center. Going back to the slides, multi-region architecture components. I would say that you would be surprised to see that there, are, there, is, that there is no much difference between single region deployments or multi-region deployments when it comes to the components. The first step is you need to select your regions. You need to pick the regions for your application deployment. And you select those regions based on various factors. One of the factors can be uh, the majority of your users can be living close in, in several locations, and then you want to pick the uh, cloud regions that are closest to those users. 
And in my sample application for my movie recommendation service, I selected three regions. I'm planning, I, I just want to shoot for the stars. I want the service to be used by the customers across the United States. That's why the application instance is going to be deployed in the United States West, Central, and East regions. And then I, what I do, I just go ahead, take my Spring Boot backend, and deploy an instance of that backend in every location. This is the first step. And this is the most easiest step to achieve. And I think that in that article by the Paramount Plus team, the folks mentioned that that was not that difficult. It was, it was clear. Another step, and this is my personal advice to you, is once you start deploying multiple application instances across various locations, take a look at global load balancers. Because why, why are they necessary? Every global load balancer comes with one virtual IP address. And you can make this virtual IP address available to all of your users, to all of your, to your uh, mobile applications, to your web front end, et cetera. And then your users will be connecting to your backend through the single IP address, and that load balancer will be routing the requests across your application instances. And the load balancer is smart. It will know, let's say, that if one user wants to watch your movies from New York, that that user leaves to close to the application instance that is in the United States East, and the request will be routed to the United States East location. So you will solve a lot of headache if you use a global load balancer. Next, but also you remember that I mentioned that quote in the beginning, the database question is not that trivial. Yes, it's easy to select regions. It's easy to deploy application instances. And then you can come up, uh, and then you can enable a global load balancer. But what's next? What should you do with the database? In, in the case with the Paramount Plus team, and this is what many of us do when we switch uh, to a multi-region setup, if you are dealing with a transactional applic application, if you are dealing with OLTP workload, and my movie recommendation service is an example of their OLTP workload, you would want you don't you don't allow yourself any data inconsistencies, and one of the typical approaches is that you go and deploy your application, your database instance, your primary database instance in one of their regions. And on this picture, what I decided, for instance, to do is, I assume that the majority of my users of my movie recommendation service lives in the East Coast. That's why the database will be there. As a result. Of what are the disadvantages of this approach? The advantage of this approach is that you are deploying your transactional relational database, and you will not have any data inconsistencies, right? This is what this is what those relational databases were designed for. But there are two gotchas, two things to keep in mind. First, the latency, the performance will be the best, and the latency will be the lowest for those users who live in the United States East. Why? Because the database needs instance is nearby them. The latency will be higher for those who live in the central or west location of the country. Another reason is high availability. Imagine that the United States East goes down. Your database becomes unavailable. And it doesn't matter that you have application instances in the west or central, right? You can have and you probably will have replica nodes in those locations. But how quickly those replica nodes will be promoted to the primaries? And will they have all the data available to them, right? That's another question. So that's why multi-region distributed databases such as Yuga by DB makes total sense for multi-region deployments. Now, let's start implementing this. Speaking about multi-region deployments, what I will show you. My configuration for today. Paramount Plus used Google Cloud Platform, and I decided to use the same environment for my experiments. I provisioned three virtual machines. This is my minimalistic configuration. One of them is in the United States West. Then we have one in the East. And the last one is the central location. What I will do next, I'm already connected to those machines because you don't want to sit and watch how I'm just SSHing into, that, uh, into those environments. And then I will start my backend, backend of my movie recommendation service. And then I will be using that API to measure the latency. Speaking about the database, I have already deployed Yuga by DB. There, so Yugo, I deployed a single stretched Yuga by DB cluster across all of those regions, and now I can connect. I can show you that cluster. For instance, that's the external IP address of this VM, and I know that a database instance runs 
In this location, I just uh, want to open the UI of the database. Yeah, I have a three node cluster and I have the nodes also running in the United States Central, East and West. So that's my deployment. Now, speaking about the ways, how should you deploy when it comes to application instances and global load balancer, it's just, just go ahead and deploy your application instances, right? There is no any secret sauce, it's all clear. When it comes to the database, you need to consider several design patterns. And Yuga by DB alone lists at least eight well-known and better test, battle tested patterns that you can pick from, because there is no any silver bullet solution when it comes to multi-region deployments. But the good news is that it's highly likely that you will find a design pattern or a couple of patterns that will satisfy the requirements of your application. So today we are going to walk through three patterns. We have eight here, but we will not have time for all of them. Uh, first, we will start with the global database design pattern. And we will discuss, we will talk also about preferred region. Then I will show you how to use the follower reads pattern to make the latency for reads across all of the locations the same. And finally, we will conclude with the latency optimized geopartitioning. With that pattern, we will be able to achieve low latency reads and writes for all of our users, for all of our locations. How about we move forward with the first pattern? If to quickly return to the slides. Going here. So the first pattern, we call it global database with a preferred region. The global database means that you have one stretched database cluster. And I have already showed you that database instance of Yuga by DB that runs across the United States East, West, and Central. And Yuga by DB is a distributed SQL database that is built in Postgres. And we shard data. We replicate this data across various locations. We use the raft consensus protocol to make sure that all of those changes are replicated synchronously. We do not allow ourselves any data inconsistencies. When it comes to multi-region deployments, Usually, we encourage uh, developers and architects to consider a configuration with the preferred region. What does it mean? For my application, I selected the United States East region as a preferred one. It means that the primary copy of my data will be stored in this region. And by default, all the read and write requests will be handled by this region. So you can deploy as many nodes as you wish in this region. I'm deploying on just one node because I just want to show you the most, the simplest configuration possible. But usually in the production environment, if you select United States East as a preferred region, then you would have multiple nodes running there so that you can load balance requests and tolerate zone level outages. But also if that region, even though that region is preferred, Whenever you update your data in the database, the changes will be synchronously replicated to the United States West and Central. So this is what the global database with the preferred region pattern means. And why would you want to have this preferred region? Because when you have this preferred region, you will minimize the number of traffic uh, that needs to go between different regions. For instance, you do, you do some select and that select need to join the data that is stored in various tables and indexes. Then it will be all queried from these nodes in the United States East. You, would not, you don't need to go to the nodes in the United States West and Central. Now, let me show you how it works in practice. And from the Yuga by DB standpoint, this is the new UI that we have. But also in Yuga by DB, we have another UI that we are replacing right now. I can connect to it on the following port number. And here is, in this configuration, I can find this information. It said, like, this is my node. This is my node from the United States East region. And it said that the leader preference is set to one, meaning that this is the preferred region and this is the preferred node. By default, all the read and write requests will go here and these nodes will be coordinating those transactions. The node in the United States Central and the region, this region is has the priority too. Why? It means that if this node or this region goes down, becomes unavailable, then Yuga by DB will, pro this, the, the, this, this is going to be the next preferred region, meaning that the nodes from this central will be handling your reads and writes by default. And, and the nodes from the West has the lowest priority right now. How does it look like? Going back to my terminal. So here is these three nodes, instances, VMs that I have here, I have already connected to them. And also, as part of the homework, I downloaded my backend. 
This is my application, movie recommendation service. Now, let me show you the latency. Is I have this application instances. I have this global database. But now let's take a look what, what it means from their latency standpoint. I don't want to demonstrate high availability today. It makes sense because it's Yuga by DB designed for to tolerate various outages. But I want you to foc I want us to focus on the latency today. And I want to show you how you can use th those design patterns to make sure the latency looks great for all of the users for all of the locations. So what I'm going to do here, I am going to connect uh, from the application instance in the east to the database node in the east, which is the preferred one. I'm starting the script. And why I don't want to show you that script? So that script just starts my Spring Boot backend and it provides several parameters like password for my database, user for my database, my database endpoint, my OpenAI API key for that similarity search. I am using OpenAI embedding model. That's why I just don't want folks to, you to see that, but trust me, there is no any secret source in that script. I just defining those environment variables and I'm starting my application backend. So I have started and now let's check the latency. I am connecting, I'm sending the same API request that I checked against my local application deployment later. And I'm asking, okay, provide me with some movie recommendations for this round. Sending. And when you let uh, the connection pools to warm up, you will see that the latency is around 10 milliseconds. And I'm getting this response, yeah, Empire Strike Backs and we have Star Wars Episode 3, etc. Wonderful, right? Why the, the latency is 10 milliseconds? Because this application instance is deployed close to the database node that is deployed in the preferred region. So that's why 10 milliseconds. But now let's be, let's talk truth here. Let's see what happens when I have my application users connecting from central and west location, how the latency will look like for them. I'm, connect, I'm going to the central location, to the central VM, and now I want to connect to my database node in the east. I can connect also, I can connect the backend on this machine to the central node, but as long as I'm using preferred region, the database node from the central will be routing requests by default to the database node in the east, which means that now I just, I'm going to do extra network round trip. That's why I will, this time I will connect my application backend in central to the database node in the east directly, just so that I can minimize the latency. Doing this, and also let me repeat the same exercise for the west, can, starting a backend and connecting it to the database. All right, it looks like we are up and running. Now I'm executing the same API call, but right now this API call is sent to my application instance in the central and take a look at the latency, all right? How do you like it? Not as good as we would want it to be, right? So here is we had 10 milliseconds and here is we have 135 milliseconds. Why so that? First thing first, because right now this request needs to go from the central location to the United States East and the round trip latency between those regions can be around like 35 milliseconds. On top of this, this is not a primitive request. I'm sending this request and that request needs to do some vector similarity search on my database. And then I need to receive this lengthy response. It's just, a, there is a lot of text. And I guess that it takes just a, a couple of network round trips to receive this message. So this is what we have here. How about the West running the same API call? And there is no surprise. We are talking about the laws of physics. We have 247 milliseconds latency. The good news here is that the current deployment, this multi-region application, it already can tolerate even region level outages. Like even if we have that meltdown in the United States East and it happens from time to time, my application and my database will be up and running. And this latency that we have in the West and in the East might be more than enough. It can be good enough for many applications. But I honestly is not happy about this latency yet because I want the latency to be the same across all of the locations. This is just basically just my wish for my movie recommendation service. So let's take this one as a baseline and see, can we achieve comparable latency across these locations? And it's possible. It's possible. You remember that we were talking about these eight multi-region design patterns? 
And there is certainly a few patterns that you can use to achieve low latency reads across various locations. What I will be using today, and I will explain why I will be using this pattern and not another, is follower reads. Let's talk about follower reads. An obvious question that some of you might ask is, Dennis, in your previous demo, when you were starting those application instances in central and west location, you connected those instances to the database node in the east. Why cannot you connect that database node to the, the, the database node to the database node, sorry, in the same location? And my explanation was that because you know, like those database nodes in the central and west still will be routing requests to the east because that's the preferred region. That's my choice. But if I enable follower reads, then I will connect my application instances in central and west to the database nodes in the same region. And then I will be reading the data from those nodes. And I will be reading the consistent copy of the data. So the data lag here, what, what does it mean? This is a transactional database and we use the raft consensus protocol. So whenever you update any record, you insert any record in the database, this change will be synchronously replicated. And it means that while this is replicated, you know, like uh, you, you update the record and this transaction is being coordinated from the United States East, the record, this update is acknowledged by the nodes in the East and Central. The transaction is considered completed uh, from the raft standpoint, but still this change is yet to be applied in the West. And that's why you can have that lag, like 65 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds. But this data lag doesn't mean data inconsistency. All the data that you store, even if you read using the follower reads, you're always going to see the consistent state of your data across all of the tables, across all of the other database objects. All right, makes sense. And why I selected this pattern for my movie recommendation service? Because I want to speed up the search. I don't care. I'm not going to update my movies catalog every other second, right? That's why this follower reads is okay for me. And even if someone decides to update this movie catalog or post some comment, and I will see this catalog update or comment like 30 milliseconds later, but I will always be seeing the consistent view of data, I'm okay. I'm fine with this. So let's see how this follower reads pattern work, works for my application. Going back to my virtual machines, Oh, no, this one, let's keep it because this is our baseline. Yeah, sometimes you see like we have eight milliseconds latency. What I'm going to do, let's start with the central location. Uh, this time I'm going to connect, this is my VM in the central and I'm connecting to the database node in the central. And also my a batch script has the following flag enable follower reads. Let's start it. When I start this application with the full in flag, basically I have all the connections that are going to be open to the database, going to use the following uh, session variables. Uh, I'm saying like, yeah, I'm going to, to use on the read on the transactions and please allow the follower, follower reads. Okay, so this is what I've done. And let's do the same in the United States West. But in the West, I'm connecting to the database node in the West. And also I'm saying enable follower reads. Cool. Okay, I don't see any exceptions. Lucky me, fingers crossed. Now, let's repeat the same search. I want to, to find suggestions for this prompt, okay? Let me run it. When you use those follower reads, it will take a little bit more time to warm up your connection pool just because we need to transfer some metadata from the preferred region. But generally, that's the latency might be high for the first request, like three seconds. But then when you repeat sending it, you will see that the latency is what we are looking for. 10 milliseconds here. How do you like it, right? And I'm getting the same result. But right now, this is a multi-region application. This is a multi-region database. And I'm seeing, I'm getting this latency in the preferred region and also in the United States West. Uh, that's central, sorry, central. Now let's go to the West. I want to see the same comparable latency in the West. Sending the same API call. It also takes time to warm up the caches because we need to preload some metadata. But once it's done, let's execute it. And how do you like it? 30 milliseconds. Job done, at least from the followers perspective. So take a look at this. Let's quickly recap. We have this multi-region application and we have a distributed database. We use this global database deployment pattern with the preferred region. And also we took advantage of the follower reads. 
okay, to show you how we can make the latency comparable. And the low latency across all of the locations translates to great user experience, right? Everyone will have the same experience. But now, again, let's challenge ourselves because the read latency looks good, right? And uh, But what's about write? What's about write? I have a few users. Let me go to data grip. And I have already connected to my database instance. Let me show you the connection properties. Yeah, that's my database instance. And I am using Postgres uh, JDBC driver. And here is it said that uh, what, yeah, you can use YugabyDB smart driver, but I just wanted to show you that you can also easily use the Postgres standard driver. Okay, test connection. Yeah, the connection went well. I don't know like why this one is spinning, but uh, let's go here. I have the same tables and I want to show you the users. I have a few users. Select from user account. Okay. I, I don't need all the columns. I need only their email and I need user location. So we have a few users. Some of them live in the East Coast, some of them live in Central and also in the West. Next, the user who is going to use their United States East location is this one. That's the email address, user1 at gmail.com. And now let's say that this is actually the user that we used here in this UI. And what you can do, let's say that you found some interesting movie that you want to add to your product catalog. And you, I, for instance, want to watch this Star Wars movie. I click Add Library button and it appears in my library. So this is how it works. Now, let's test the right latency for this user. I am running a few API calls and what these calls do, they just deleting my user catalog and then they inserting this uh, movies back into the database. And if you repeat it a few times, you will see what how the write latency looks like. So the latency is going to be around 76 milliseconds for the user who lives in the United States East. Why? Because this user, because I would say first that that's a expected latency for the current deployment, because the user lives close to their database instance deployed in a preferred region. And when I send those updates, yeah, it just takes time to replicate this change synchronous using the RAF protocol across the other regions. So 76 milliseconds is a reasonable number for this request. Now let's compare this latency for the central location. In the central location, we have uh, this user, user to gmail.com who lives in Chicago. And now if I run this request, ah, yeah, I'm lazy. What I need to do right now? I need to reconnect to, I can reconnect to this node in the central location without follower reads. Because what I did, folks, when you use those follower reads, you remember those flags that you pass when you open connection. You can set those flags for every connection or for every request or for every session. And I'm lazy. I'm lazy. I just decided to use those flags for all of the connections. And that's why if you use those flags, you will not be able to send updates. That's why the best practice usually is just you can create several connection pools within your application. And some of the connection pools will be using the follower reads and other will be using just regular operations with updates. I'm just lazy. Just But keep this in mind. This is actually a good uh, a good remark. So now I'm connected and I'm sending these updates. And you can see that the latency from the central location is around like 110 milliseconds. Why? Because from the central, first, this updates needs to go to the preferred region in the east, and then from the preferred region, it's going to be replicated back to the central and to the west. It takes time, like it's like 100 milliseconds. But here is we are talking about strong consistency. And finally, going to the west. In the west, I also need to reconnect to the node in the west. Because as I said, I was lazy. I did not implement separate pools or other techniques for the follower reads. That's why I'm restarting without follower reads right now. And uh, when I'm sending this API call from here, yeah, it looks like it's still starting. Mm -hmm. It took a little bit more time to start it. One more time. Mm 
Okay. It's waking up. Hello, friends. I'm back. Can you hear me? Hey, Dennis. Yeah. Actually, All right. this is this is yeah, this is the reason why you should build multi-region applications. Are you still live? Yes, we are indeed. Yeah, I apologize. So Eventually to, to anyone who had any questions. So there may come there may be a couple of questions that come through just while we were waiting for you, but Yeah, thanks for thanks for taking over. But generally what happened, probably some of you saw during this presentation that uh, my laptop was complaining about hello memory and eventually it froze. Now, let me quickly get back because we have 15 minutes left and I think that we will be able to make it to the end. Uh, cuz that's what we are having with these laptops. Now, but my application is still up and running, right? Cuz I'm running it across multiple regions. I'm just making sure that Everything is good. Okay. What's about the database? Yeah, the database luckily was not running on my laptop. It was running across multiple regions. Now, I need to reopen connections to those VMs uh, so that I can demonstrate you the final pattern. Uh, and now you will see the whole process. Certificates, uh, GCP default, uh, DMAGDA. So let me connect to the database node in their east. This is my east location. I'm connecting to the east. Yes, please let me in. And my application is in here, Yuga Plus uh, backend environment. Let me copy this one. Now, this is my east location, right? Next, you remember that we had an instance in the central location. Yeah, I should have copied this one. Where is it? Where is it? SSH. I need to SSH to the location in the central. Good. Yep. Just to make things look shorter, that's going to be central. And we are also going to the same location. Finally, let's restore our connection to the west. To the west. Here is in the west the IP address. At least right now you know that there is that's not a fake demo. Because I'm opening and showing you the entire process, how I was connecting to those VMs the real machines, the real application instances. It's only that my laptop, it let me down. Okay, and this is the West. And finally, please bring me to this directory. Cool. Now, where did we stop? Just in case, uh, let me check the connection. I remember that I managed to restart the application instances in the central location. Uh, let me send a few updates to that location. Yeah, that's the right latency from the central. Also, let's take a look at the right latency from the from the east preferred region. Yeah, it's also going to be around like 70, 90 milliseconds, depends. Uh, let's give it, it the best score right now. And from the west, yeah, I managed to restart it. That's the right latency that we have in the West, but usually it's going to be also in the range between like 100 milliseconds, 150 or 200 milliseconds. And the next question is, is this all we can expect with multi-region applications? Because yes, we were talking about Raft consensus protocol, about transactional database. And does it mean that if when we go for multi-region setup that we need to sacrifice the right latency? Not necessarily, my friend. You remember those design patterns? For global applications and among those design patterns you can certainly find a few that will help you to achieve low latency for both reads and writes for my application today i am going to experiment with the following pattern it's called latency optimized geo partitioning what does it mean with the latency optimized geo partitioning you can pick some of your tables and partition and geo partition them for instance i have this user library right that my users are updating whenever they want to add a movie to a catalog. And I know the location of those users. And I can pin the user data to the closest regions of their location. For instance, if the user lives in the United States, New York, in New York, then I want everyone who lives in New York or Boston 
or I don't know, or Washington DC, I want all of their data to be stored in the United States East nodes. If you live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, then I want your data to be automatically pinned to the database nodes in that location. And the database, what you should do as a developer and architect, you just need to define that geo partitioning column. It can be custom column, it can be any value, it can be country, region, data warehouse, whatever you like. And then the database internally will decide how to geo partition this data. Now, let's walk through this experiment together. And by doing, and, and actually, as a quick note, right, by using this uh, approach, this design pattern, you will be able to achieve low latency reads and writes for this data. Now, how does it look like? If I jump back to my application, uh, so here is I have this script that we are going to execute uh, against our database. So, first one, I will create three table spaces. And those of you who are familiar with Postgres, you know what a table space is. Those who are not, table spaces based with special database objects that helps you to define special locations in your database, like such as disk drives, etc., where you can pin your data. And we at Yugabyte decided to take advantage of this concept, but for the geo partition deployment. So generally, here is I'm creating a table space for the United States East data, central data, and West data. And then I will recreate this user library table. So what I will do. I will create it and I will say, all right, I'm using the Postgres partitioning feature to partition all the records as follows. For instance, if you live in, the, in New York or Boston, then your data will live in the following partition and this partition will be mapped to the table space in the United States East. So all the nodes, the database nodes that are deployed in the United States East, they will be keeping this data. If you live, let's say, in Chicago, Kansas City, then your data belongs to the central table space, to the central nodes. And if you are from the West Coast, then your data will be in the West Coast. So that's what you need to do from the database uh, standpoint. Uh, let me, let's, I have not created those table spaces yet. So we are doing this live. Let's go to data grip. I think that data grip was the reason why my laptop froze because it was eating a lot of memory. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's uh, do this, executing this line by line. First, I want to create those table spaces in my database. Cool. Uh, next, I am recreating this table. In real life, you certainly are not going to drop your existing table, but for the sake of the demo, to make things fast, I will recreate it quickly. And I have already partitioned, and now I need to create these partitions. Creating the partitions. And if you know Postgres, then you know that those partitions are regular table. They're just tables, and you can see these tables that you added to my schema. Now, it's all done. What I want to do next, you remember this initial request where I had my select, select email and user location from user account. Let's run it. Yeah, I have users. And this user with email, uh, user one Gmail lives in New York, which means that all his or her data will be stored in the database node in the New York City, in the United States East Coast. Let's confirm it. So you remember that was our latency. That's how much, uh, that was what, what we managed to get. But right now I'm not restarting my application. What we did, I just geo partitioned that user library table and if I execute the same request right now, take a look at the latency. Two milliseconds, two milliseconds. Just think about this. Why two milliseconds? Because right now, I just have one single node in that region. In real life, you will deploy, like when you geo-partition data, then probably you will deploy at least across multiple availability zones. You will have nodes spanning multiple availability zones in the east, or you can also store a copy of the data in closed regions and other regions. So eventually in real production environments, this latency for uh, geo-partitioned requests, for write requests, and this is the write request, it can be in the range between, let's say, a few, like one millisecond and up to 20 milliseconds. That's what we usually see. And it depends on how many zones or regions your geo-partition table spans. But this is cool, right? This is your write latency. Now let's repeat the same exercise, but from the central location. Connecting. 
let's let's do it one more time because I think in the beginning, yes, it also was refreshing some metadata because that table became geopartitioned and the central node is not preferred. It was loading some metadata. So the latency is also like eight milliseconds. Let's check like two milliseconds. How do you like it? That's the right latency. And for the West, uh, let me run the same request for the West. I'm updating the user catalog from the West. Yeah, it takes like, again, this is geo partition table, and I think the node from the west loads some metadata from the east. So that's why the first request is slow. But then, like five milliseconds, two milliseconds, this is what you're getting. Let's conclude. So what we have learned today. We learned that Paramount Plus learned the art of scaling. They managed to create a streaming platform that successfully works across multiple cloud regions and it can tolerate various outages and it can provide exceptional user experience. And also today you could witness how you can quickly create a sample application and then you can deploy that sample application across multiple regions and you explored several design patterns for global uh, databases. We took a look at their global design pattern with preferred region follower reads and latency optimized geo partitioning. And in my sample application, as you see, I mixed and matched those patterns because it's up to you. You can use, you know, just one pattern. You can use two patterns. You can th use three patterns. It's up to you. And you can decide this on the table level. What's next? The next is I wish you luck so that you find a use case to build multi-region applications. And keep in mind that you don't need to have an application that has the scale comparable to Super Bowl. There are many reasons when you want to deploy multi-region applications, scalability, high availability, low latency across regions or data regulatory requirements. For instance, this one, geopartitioning, I demonstrated this pattern today from the latency standpoint, but also many use it from the data compliance standpoint when your user data needs to be located in specific uh, regions or data centers. And finally, also, we see that many, many folks, many more folks are getting interested in this multi-region and global applications. And many of us use Postgres. Those multi-region applications uh, require distributed Postgres. And we used YugabyDB today. And YugabyDB is the distributed Postgres. That's why today I'm happy to pre-announce a new hands-on course where you will learn how to build those scalable and fault-tolerant applications that run on distributed Postgres SQL on YugabyDB. Because today, what I showed you today, today I showed you the end product. I have already created that movie recommendation service and I have already provisioned those database nodes, right? And I managed just to fail my laptop. But eventually you did not see the beginning. You did not see how we were creating that application, what design choices we were making while we were building that application. And in that course, you will get many questions answered. So that's why sign up here, use this QR code, and we will let you know as soon as the course is available because you're going to learn a ton from it. So I think that uh, we made it and we had uh, three minutes left. So if you have any other questions, please uh, go ahead and ask. Let me check the chat. No, I don't see anything here. If not, I hope that you enjoyed this session. I hope that you learned and you know right now how to build those types of applications and how useful they are. That's why wish you luck and stay tuned for more courses and content from us. We will make sure that you can build those applications that scale and never fail. Bye-bye now.